ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Sam Roberts Wrestling Podcast. Introducing your host from New York, here is Sam Roberts. Welcome back to the Not Sam Studio and Sam Roberts Wrestling Podcast. And with me, Sam Roberts, the last professional broadcaster, at this time is the creator of the hit show Billions, as well as a screenwriter on a ton of projects and and a director and all kinds of stuff. But most importantly, like I think a bigger wrestling fan than anybody actually realizes. A big wrestling fan. Brian Koppelman. Thank you, Brian Koppelman. Yes, co-creator of Billions. Um, and uh, I run the show with David Levine, my lifelong best friend and creative partner. So if I say I when talking about this stuff, it's always Dave and me. Right, that's what it, that's what it means. But you're, you guys are the reason why it's not a coincidence why Dan Soder gets gifted a poster from King of the Ring or there's a reference to uh, uh, bear hugs in the premiere of season four or whatever it is. Yeah, I mean, um, the wrestling stuff's been in the show from the beginning. There have always been some references. Um, and, and in fact... We have named characters after professional wrestlers in some sneaky ways for like our whole career. Really? Yeah. And there have been little references and stuff to the wrestlers who meant the most to us. And to me, I'm the bigger wrestling fan than Dave. But one of the things about being lifelong best friends is when we were writing together, sometimes he'll throw a wrestling reference into the show just to make me laugh. (laughs) And because we've been pals since we were 14, like... He probably can't tell you the difference between Tony Gurria and Tony Atlas, but he's had to hear those names right. for his whole <laughs> life, so he knows that they exist. Did you know that Married with Children did that too? What did they do? The, the, the Bundy family is named after King Kong Bundy. That's great. And no. the Rhodes family that, li- that lived next door to him is it's Dusty Rhodes. The American, the American Dream. Is that what you're telling yes, me? Yes, yes. Not... The, the, the creators of that show were also big wrestling fans, and the, those families oh, were legit that's, named I, after. I am literally wearing a Dusty Rhodes shirt right now. <laughs> and that wasn't because, listening. was that because of this, or was no, that just because I, I that's mean, what I you wear? I grabbed the shirt, and then I was like, oh, that's funny. Right. I'm going to wear it. Right. But I mean, my, I mean I, I'm so, my, my wife is the greatest human being in the world, and we've been married for, I'm like one of the few truly happily married people you'll ever meet. Mm-hmm. And literally, though... Uh, just recently she was like I gotta throw out these few wrestling shirts and I said um, no, she's just not, we're not throwing them out she's like but they're I mean that Dusty Road shirt looks bad on you and I was like that's the American dream, sweetheart. What? Sure, yeah. That is, that's Dusty Rhodes. I mean, I'm yeah. not. You start telling her about hard times? Yeah. Let me tell you hard oh, times. I showed it to her. <laughs> I mean, I showed her the great two and a half minutes. Right, right. I showed it to Did her. Did it resonate with her? Yes. Because sometimes. Got, no, no. She's a lifelong Springsteen fanatic. So that so she gets completely it. resonates right. with her. Yeah, because yes. sometimes I'll show like wrestling stuff to my wife and be like, this is like a life changer for me. And she's like, oh, yeah. And you're just like, I. No, you have no. If you can watch. Dusty Rhodes hard time speech. Yeah. And not be moved by it. Have you seen Sir, the, I do not want to be your friend. No. Have you seen the YouTube video that somebody did the Dusty Rhodes speech but uh doing a Morgan Freeman impression? Nope. And you, it's at like the a, end of this it's like a voiceover I'll show to you. To me yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's really no. great. But the reason uh that uh I had you on specifically this week is because I met you not too long ago at the uh, press screening for the Andre the Giant yeah. documentary, which was amazing. Yeah, it was great because you've been friends with my sister for a long time. Jenny Hutt, yeah. who does a show over on Sirius XM. But it was one of the, you know, I was asking you, oh, are you like a wrestling fan? Or are you just friends with Bill Simmons? Oh, the Andre or, the Giant thing, Right, yeah. at the Andre thing. And you were like, no, I'm an old school wrestling fan. And immediately you got into Bruno San Martino. And we were talking about Bruno and, and, and how he was the guy for you and all this stuff. And so go forward, you know, a few months. And this must have, this one must have hit you like a ton of bricks. Yeah. Um, it's funny. The There are certain figures from your childhood or c- certain moments uh, from your childhood that just, they go so deep for you. They resonate in such a heavy way. And Bruno San Martino meant something to me as a kid growing up on Long Island. I mean, I had other sports heroes and I had movie heroes. But there was something about the unadorned nature of who Bruno San Martino was. Um, I grew up in the 70s. So I was 10 in 76. In 78, when he lost to superstar Billy Graham. It was 78, right? When he I lost believe to so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Billy Graham, who uh, used leverage of the third of the rope when he pinned 
Bruno. And there's still been no justice for that. Not, not at You're all. Waiting for him. <laughs> I mean, it was so clear. You could see in Wrestler Magazine, in the Wrestler Magazine, the right. shot is super clear that when he hasn't pinned, his foot is on the rope. And you get in this magazine, like, look, it's right, it's it's right, right there. there in the magazine. Why I mean, can't these people see it's it? It's right there. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, the ref was, that day, the ref had a bad day. I mean, he just missed it. Yeah. I don't know how. Well, you would think after the magazine was published, they would do something. Maybe the referee could think about I guess referee's decision is final. Yeah. That just confirmed that Bruno wanted, that, you know, Bruno wanted to be done and everything. Because, I mean, if anything, if any, if any uh, organization would have ever used it, it would have been the WWWF. But so when I first saw San Martino, I was probably nine or 10 and I was watching, you know, WOR Channel 9 after the harness racing. And I saw these larger than life characters, Ernie Ladd and Stan Hansen and, you know, Bruiser Brody and Mil Mascaris and Chief J. Strongbow and the Executioners. But then in the middle, you know, all these people had a gimmick. Right. And I know, you know, wrestlers now talk about their gimmick as the item that they sell <laughs> sure. or whatever, right? Like, hey, yeah. man, you got my gimmick on. No, we're it's selling like, gimmicks. You're, yeah, 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 you're selling yeah. your gimmicks. But everybody had like a thing mm-hmm. that, that they did. Um, something, you know, Ernie Loud was an ex-pro football player. Right. And he was six foot six and was like one of the only, at the time, uh, if you were a person of color, you were, and you weren't doing, um, if you were a person of color and you weren't playing some other group, right. you were not a headliner. Right. You, you were a like, jobber Like a Samoan mostly. or like yeah, whatever. That's like what I'm saying. The, you like weren't you putting were, on yeah. some gimmick for yourself, something. Mm-hmm. Um, so Ernie Loud was a headliner, African-American, six foot six. They the would say cat. six nine. He was yeah. the big cat. Hit the foreign object on his um, thumb, and he also wore a crown into the ring. Of course, right? And Stan. So he Hansen, looked even taller, right? Yeah. So he was, yeah, he was coming in there seven feet. Yeah. And you know, Stan Hansen had the lariat, and he was a Texas shit kicker. Yeah. And then you had Bruno, who had no shtick. Right. All that guy had was like, I'll tell you, Vince, I'm standing here, <laughs> and I'm going to beat this man. You know, I'm not the tough, smartest guy in the world, but I'm pretty tough. And there was something. In a, you know, as a 9, 10, 11 year old, you're starting to figure out the world's complicated or more complicated than you thought it was. Right. Or that was promised to you. Like you, and, start, to, you start to figure out that injustice is a thing. Yeah, there's injustice in yes, the world. Yes. But not only injustice, there's like, um, there's gray area. Mm-hmm. There's like a lot that's neither right nor wrong. Right. Okay. And then in the middle of it was this guy who was like, yeah, yeah, but I'm going to go into that world yeah. of doubt and insecurity and and bad decisions and I'm going to fight for the simple truths of it. And I know this all sounds like complicated or like grandiose language, but that is what professional wrestling is. It's these very primal ideas put on a stage right. in an elaborate, almost kabuki theater kind of a way. And in the middle of that was this dude who was like, I'm exactly what I say I am. I may be, and you know, by the time I was 11 or 12, I realized um, I didn't know the words work and shoot, but I realized the thing was a work. But I didn't care because I knew that that guy had that big a heart. Like, I didn't know the whole story then, you know. I didn't know his family almost all got killed in the Holocaust. And none of this is wrestling lore. None of this is written by right, writers. It's like, real life. This is actual, th- yeah. the actual biographical details of Bruno San Martino right. are that he came from Abruzzi, Italy. Mo- he he was um, in a state of true physical starvation for over a year. He almost died. He lost, I think, three of his brothers and sisters. I think they were. Were there like seven, seven of them and, and three? To, three? Yeah, three yeah. died. And he came... And, and that was before they were hiding from the Nazis that they died, right? Well, that, no, no the they were hiding. Died. I think they were hiding from the Nazis. Because and, they were... And then... So they were... Yeah, they were hiding from the Nazis. Yeah. He... You know, they somehow got here and he was this... Made fun of for being, I mean, it is like a superhero origin story, but this stuff's all been fact checked and, and, and it's true. Mm-hmm. He was um, an incredibly skinny, um, easily made fun of kid who found the gym. And in the gym, he worked and worked and he did become like the strongest guy in America. And that, that I think was also part of the appeal was that he had this body where he's as big as a house, but there's something attainable about it. Like it's still yes. a human, right? Yeah, because he wasn't, as you know, one of the reasons he left um, organized professional wrestling was he wouldn't take steroids. Right. So he just looked like big, but and, he wasn't like ripped. And in. it's not only that he yeah. wouldn't take them, they made him angry. Right. It's not just that he was like, hey, I don't want to do He was like, uh, he was an old school Italian guy who was like, you know, get this reefer out of here. <laughs> right. I mean, he just yes. didn't want any of that crap. Yes. It's just like not, he's like Don Corleone or something. Stop right. with that foolishness with that young girl. Right. Like he didn't want any of that stuff. Right. He, so 
He had a code that he lived by, and that's what he, he, it wasn't just him living by it. That's what he wanted around him. Yes. Right? He insisted upon it. Right. You know, so you had this guy who was just like, I'm going to become the strongest. And then he fucking became the strongest. Right. And, you know, got... Um, won all these powerlifting competitions and then someone saw him and said you should be a wrestler mm -hmm. he was like I don't know about this wrestling thing but I'll try you know <laughs> and then suddenly became uh, back to uh, I'm yeah, not the smartest I'll man I'm but the I smartest think I can uh... gonna... and then you know he he has this incredible rise when when I first came up upon him as an eight or nine year old whatever I was probably eight um, he was already Bruno San Martino he'd already been the champion for a long time and he had just won the belt back but I could sense without even knowing you could look in that guy's eyes and you knew he'd gotten himself here through like grit, yeah. determination and sort of um, an, an immovability. Like he just put his feet in the ground and he said, uh, I'm going to become this thing. And the great story. And he tells us, um, I know I'm on your great wrestling podcast, but I, I think the single best hour, hour and a half of a, po uh, a wrestling podcast I've ever heard, and it's one of the best. I'm a podcaster, too. I have a podcast called The Moment. And we don't really talk wrestling that much, but uh, it's a good podcast. But uh, <laughs> I, Colt Cabana interviewed Bruno oh. for an hour and a half. Yeah. And by the way, you can plug Colt Cabana on this podcast or you're blue in the face. But that in, in that episode of the podcast, Bruno, for the first time ever himself, told the incredible story of how he became the champ. Yeah. And Which is a rare thing because Bruno... He doesn't do he never that. Broke K so Bruno never broke kayfabe, and he right. still found a way to keep kayfabe in the story. It's brilliant. But, which was brilliant, yeah. I think. But yes, that's another thing about San Martino that you know, but I don't know if your audience understands that. How much does your audience understand about the kayfabe era? of? Like, how much do you talk well, about the kayfabe era you know, and Carney speak and sort of why that? I think that I would say the majority of the audience, because we don't get super in depth. This isn't like an educational. This is more just like we hang out with some yeah, wrestlers right, and sure. fans, and then we talk about the current day product. I think that people know that it came from Carney days and kind of know what the words mean because they're all over the internet. But I, I would imagine that more people than I think don't really know the, 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 how Carney this thing was. Well, yeah, so the, the carnival, the, the language comes from Carney, and even when we say that, like, we're all, none of us, look, I'm 51, and I even wasn't really alive when carnivals worked the way carnivals worked at the beginning yeah. in the 1900s. I mean, it's going back to, like, from. It's like, con art. It's, if you should go watch the movie House of Games, which gives you some of the language. It's uh -huh. a great movie about modern-day con artists, but... You know, if you would go to a carnival, you would go to a town, all the games in carnivals are rigged. Do people know that? Like, I would hope so. All carnival games are rigged. Even and, to this day, most are. And they would say, I mean, the story that I've always heard is that, like, the term mark for fan comes from, I always thought it was just, like, like it, it's just a, a derogatory term, whatever. But it is, they would, somebody would put chalk on their chalk, hand. Chalk, they would chalk mark you. And when they would find a guy who was a sucker and would play this game pat him on the back and say better luck next time and then as he walked down the boardwalk everybody saw the mark on his back and that knew guy's a, that guy's a mark he's a sucker a sharp yeah you know, the, and and so the carny language when the wrestlers started going across the country at first they wanted to wrestle but then they realized well we can't beat the shit out of each other every night right and so they came up with this um uh, idea that they were going to protect each other in the ring mm -hmm. so that they could thrive and have this life. And they borrowed the language of Carney because they were wrestling in carnivals too. I mean, mm -hmm. it, they were all intermingled in that culture. But what wrestlers believed for a very long time was that people would stop watching. They, that it was with a wink. Everyone knew that wrestling was fixed. Yeah. Even in the 60s and 50s and 40s. But that if you really told them, they would stop watching and they would think less of you and they wouldn't be able to believe the story. Well, yeah, I mean, you talk about that moment that you had where, where when you just said, you know, I was 11 or 12 and I saw Bruno lose the title and by then I kind of knew but didn't care. That is something that I think is lost on people that aren't fans, but even I think old school workers that didn't realize that fans don't care. Like when I went to my first show, my parents told me I was eight. It was 1992. It was SummerSlam in England. And... The seats were pretty close because my dad was working in an advertising agency and at the last minute he had scored some like, you know, whatever, 15th row, 12th row tickets or something. And they were worried because I was eight and wrestling was my whole life. And they were like, he's going to get smartened up. He's going to see what's going on here and he's not going to like this stuff anymore. And like I left that place, number one, nothing, no news because I had never thought about whether it was or wasn't. And I was just sort of over the moon at seeing it up close and personal because I don't think... 
fans of this thing because we for the beginning of time since we're tiny little kids even if we think it's real we get the entertainment aspect of it and that never changes right well, also plus these guys are so good at what they do right that in the moment they convince you it's happening right look i spent my life making movies and television shows right they're not real right right i mean right. dude the dude on billions his voice doesn't even sound like that no, he's right. Bobby Axel, in real life he's a brit right i yeah. mean it's it's crazy and by the way we're able to you know on the same network a couple years before that he was a politician that might have been a terrorist like we can accept that yes on shows like that and i think that most fans of wrestling realize that yeah we're i mean we're getting the same thing except also i mean it's a you know especially in the 70s where I, when I grew up I mean I saw the president of the United States resign from office right what wasn't rigged right in the 70s you start to realize, when I was growing up well that's why I think wrestling fans know that it's all a lie <laughs> right like the smartest wrestling fans don't care because everything's a lie it's all the work yeah. whether, you're, whether you're watching the news or whether you're watching the NFL or whether you're watching Billions or whether you're watching WWE it's all work yeah there are moments of real human behavior and sure. real human reaction sure that happen but I mean all you need to do really and again I'm sure this was something that a wrestling fans most wrestling fans probably, probably watch, but um, the the movie, what is it, Above the Ropes or Beyond the Ropes? What, Beyond the Mat. Beyond the Mat. Beyond the Mat. I mean, you watch Beyond the Mat. Amazing. And that's all you need to know about how real it, it is. But, right. But w w what I was going to say is that um, Bruno had something else going on with the kayfabe thing. And and then I'll tell the, the story of, of how he became champion, but Bruno um, wouldn't break kayfabe because he knew that there were all these Italian immigrants and their kids who believed in his entire thing. Right. The story the of The story Bruno. of Bruno San Martino. The one guy fighting for good and for integrity and for right. Mm -hmm. The one guy who was never a heel. Mm -hmm. One guy who never, ever... Uh, went back on his word. Bruno's word was his bond, right? Mm -hmm. And so he could not uh, disappoint those people. Right, because in his mind, people find out it's a work and it's all a lie, right? Everything. So what did he stand for? Then? Right, right. If you knew who was going to win, that's right. what were you fighting against? And And the ironic thing is, the whole story is still true. Like, he still had to fight his way. Every, you, know, you hear about when he got blackballed from... Well, this is what I'm going to say. Yeah, like, yeah, the, yeah. Go ahead, then. The, well, no, this is the thing. Like, yeah. so the way Bruno San Martino became champ is... So he, he he's a... He's the first a, time. And he died... This is how he beat... When he beat Buddy Rogers mm -hmm. um, in 1958, right. 59, um, in 53 seconds, I think. Mm -hmm. What happened was, but before that, he comes to New York because... Uh, this guy finds him and says, you should go be a wrestler. He starts wrestling, and he has a great gimmick. He lifts up. Uh, Vince McMahon Sr. realized this was the strongest guy in wrestling, and he has him lift up Haystacks Calhoun at Madison Square Garden. And the newspapers pick up on it, and it becomes a big story. And, you know, even if Haystacks, I mean, Haystacks wasn't really 600 pounds. What? <laughs> but, but he did, you know, and even if Haystacks, like, helped him, he still had to hold Haystacks in the air. Right. And by the way, Haystacks wasn't 600 pounds, but he was pretty heavy. He you was know? 400 pounds. Yeah, exactly. I mean, he was. Exactly. And um, Bruno lifted him up, and it was an incredible thing, and it got huge news coverage. And Buddy Rogers was a champ, and Buddy Rogers was insanely popular and could sell out the building. Mm -hmm. And Buddy Rogers started noticing that when Bruno would show up, he would get a bigger reaction from the crowd. He would get a bigger pop. Uh, the guys Bruno was fighting against would get bigger, more heat, and Buddy Rogers didn't like that. And he told Vince that he didn't want the guy fighting right before him on the cards. And Bruno couldn't live with that because Bruno had left his wife. He married young. He cared about his wife. Mm -hmm. If he's going to be on the road, it was so that he could earn a real living. And he knew the way to earn a real living was to be at the top of the card. Right. And So Buddy wanted him to either like be the opening match or not be on the or show. Or not be on the show. Gotcha. And Vince Sr. went along. Buddy was his champ. Of course. And they had had a long history together. Right. Hey, was it true? I've asked a lot, just stop for a second. Is it true that in the, up until sort of like the 70s, until Hulk, I guess, they would only give the belt to someone who could like actually fight as a shoot in case someone wanted to take it? I've, I've always heard that, that that was... And Do you that's, think that's true? I believe so. And that's why there's all these stories about, you know, Hogan was the first of the era that was like the entertainer. And the Iron Sheiks got the stories about them trying to pay him 
the people in the AWA trying to pay him to legit break Hogan's leg to prove that this guy and I think that that's true I think it goes along with all the all the folklore you hear about the territory days yeah, of oh, guys I'm, I'm fascinated by territory guys days. getting fired if they didn't win fights and bars if somebody, right, if somebody pushes you yeah. I believe it because yeah. because it goes back to what we were saying before because carny mentality was still kayfabe was still real like you had to push these guys as tough guys and when you Talk to them when you see footage of them. Yeah, like, like Harley Race was genuinely a tough guy. Exactly. Exactly. Terry Funk was genuinely a tough guy. And the fans are afraid of him. You right. know what I mean? Like, and it's still a little that way in Japan. When a big guy goes into the audience in Japan, there's not a swarm of people like hitting him on the shoulder right. and stuff like that. If a heel goes into the crowd and starts swinging his arms, the Japan fans are running, running. Awesome. I didn't know that. Yeah. No, because you know, I went. I took some. I uh, took like my nephew and his friend to see Roman Reigns, and like. Yeah, that guy's just so. Fr I mean, everyone there is right. now just so friendly. And well, yeah, and it gets sad. to the point where you're like, uh, I've watched shows, for better or worse, when a heel will say something to a kid or rip a sign or do something like that, and the kid will start crying. And like I've watched it, it's main event like tag matches, right? And while the heel's partner is in the ring, the heel will come off the apron when he hopes the crowd isn't really looking and go over to the kid and like say like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry or whatever. And the kid will end up getting to go backstage and meet like the guys. Like there's there's just, and I think, you know, part it of it. Like, Ernie Lyman no. was not doing that. No. He just wasn't. But it's also Ernie the Lyman culture. in character. It's man. also the culture we live in. I think like a publicly traded company or any big company needs to worry about, you know, and the WWE some mom I'll say, tweeting. Like, it was an incredible night. Like, I watched these kids at the time of their lives. Right. So I've never seen an organization care more about making the fans happy yes. than the WWE does, yes. and I think it's amazing. Actually. Although there's still guys like, uh, I've interviewed Chris Jericho before, and Chris will say that uh, he won't, if he's a heel, when he did his last heel run when he was wearing the suit, and the, he won't sign autographs. So like a kid will come up to him and go like, oh, can I have your autograph? And he'll just like kind of look at him like disdainfully and just walk right past him and his dad oh, he's is selling sitting there. It. Right. He's selling it. Because he knows because he's like I'm on my way into that building I need to get and I want that kid booing. to boo me. And he goes, you know, they wanted to sell t-shirts. No Jericho t-shirts if Jericho's a heel. Like, you know what I mean? Like, because I don't want people cheering for me in that building. Oh, that's all, Which that's becomes great. a more and more difficult thing to do as fans get that's smarter. That's super intense. But, yeah. so, Bruno's, so Bruno's on this card. I mean, Bruno's wrestling on these cards and he's told... Buddy Rogers doesn't want you near this thing. Right. So he leaves and he and he goes, they tell him, he says, all right, I'll go wrestle in another territory. And Vince Senior's like, well, let's see how that works out for you. And he takes all his money, Bruno, and he doesn't really have very much. Mm -hmm. And this is another documented story. And he like um, tries to rent a car and he ends up hitchhiking and he gets to California where he's been promised that he's going to be able to wrestle in that territory because these there was no monolithic WWW for WWE right. or there were these territories there was no big organization but there was a code among the guys who ran the territories right and it was a way to prevent these wrestlers from doing what they want the wrestlers didn't really have independence the territory owners had independence mm -hmm. but there were, if a wrestler made a deal that he was in your territory even if he didn't have a written contract he, they, it was like the mob right. you couldn't leave you, and so when Bruno got out west to wrestle and spent his last dollar to get there, he was blackballed. And what that means is Vince Senior had called the guy who ran that territory and said, as a personal favor to me, don't wrestle San Martino. And, and who the, was the biggest star in the West Coast at this time? Probably Freddie Blassie that was like oh, around yeah, then? Sure. Yeah, sure. Uh, Freddie Blassie a little older than Bruno, yeah, yeah, but yeah. yes, he would have been big in the yeah. uh, West. And, um, and probably Mil Mascaros coming up from... Probably, yeah, from Mexico. From Mexico, yeah, yeah. right? And so... Uh, he gets sent back from the West Coast because the deal was, right, if 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 the guy who ran the West Coast would have let Bruno wrestle, then Vince Sr. would have felt free to steal any of his guys and wrestle them in his territory. Right, you got to have cooperation. So they had to make these deals with each other. Yeah. But the result of it was San Martino's out there on the West Coast and blackballed. And then he hears about a guy like in Cincinnati and he goes to Cincinnati and that guy blackballs him. And he's shut out of the entire United States. So he's spending all his money driving around because it's not like you've got cell phones and emails and like no, direct not message. And, no, you know, not like, yeah. So he's just got to drive to the town, takes days, days to get there. No money. And he can't call no his money. wife from a payphone. Right. Then he can't call his wife again for, you know, right. three days. And he gets there. Last his wife heard, it's like, okay, I'm going to California to wrestle. A week later, he's like, no, 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 I'm not blackballing California. In fact, I'm in Cincinnati I'm and I can't wrestle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So he goes up to Montreal. 
somehow he finds out there's oh I forget the wrestler and it's it's um maybe it's Antonino Rocca or Gorilla Monsoon it's it's a guy you've heard of mm -hmm. basically said to Bruno I'll make a call for you to this guy in Montreal mm -hmm. and Bruno meets this guy in Montreal and the guy says all right I'll you can wrestle for me I don't like this idea mm -hmm. of these people blackballing you but if I do this you have to wrestle for me I'm going to make this happen for you you have to show up twice a week you have to wrestle for me twice a week no matter what in the building so three times a week or whatever the thing was yeah and Bruno's like if you do this for me I'm committed to you I'll do it because that was Bruno that was Bruno San Martino and he does it and what Bruno knew and what Buddy Rogers was afraid of turned out to be true which was the moment he stepped into a ring it doesn't matter if it's a Canadian crowd or a Japanese crowd or a European crowd or a New York crowd everybody loves him he's getting over he had the magic yeah he just had the magic it wasn't a particular set of writers mm -hmm. it wasn't a particular storyline it was what that guy brought into the ring. So with him. he know this isn't this isn't a New York thing because he was the New York guy. This isn't a New York thing. No, yeah, he was from Pittsburgh, but then right, 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 right. To Pittsburgh. This isn't an East Coast but it's thing. Not. Yeah, he went into the ring in Montreal and immediately started selling out the buildings, right. the arenas, killing it. And Vince Senior got word of this happening and tried to entice Bruno to come back. And Bruno said, "Only if you make me the champ." And he said, "Well, buddy, won't do it." And he said, well, I don't care. You gotta, I got to know I'm going to be the champ. Because, like you said, he's going to make a living. Yeah. And if he's got the ability to headline, he should be headlining. I have to headline. They yeah. want to see me. I'll sell the building. Yeah. Make me champ. Yeah. Vince says, I can't. Bruno says, well, I'm not coming. And besides, you blackballed me. I'll take the blackball off. You can. All right. Li but listen, I'm not coming. Right. Champ. So finally, Bruno's so big and Vince Sr.'s feeling in a sense of embarrassment. Mm -hmm. I had this guy. Mm -hmm. And the guy's destroying it in Canada and he's going from Montreal and he's driving to Pittsburgh like every two weeks to see his wife and then driving back to Montreal and finally <laughs> his wife's still in Pittsburgh yeah still never left Pittsburgh. Never that's left. amazing and and it says uh, finally you know Vince Senior says okay and this is where it's great because Bruno keeps faith, kayfabe mm -hmm. okay uh, you're going to be the champ but I can't get Buddy to go I don't know that Buddy's going to go along with it and the story is Bruno says it is. They set the match, Shea Stadium, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, he comes back to wrestle Buddy Rogers and they facing each other. And it's clear to Bruno right away that Buddy doesn't want to do it. So Bruno supposedly says to him, it can go hard or it can go easy. And Buddy sort of says, take your best shot. And in 53 seconds. Do you believe it? Do you believe that Bruno won? I have uh, to believe shoot? it. Well, here's the thing, right? What Bruno did was by dint of his own will, and he tells the story much better than I'm telling it. But imagine just being, just for a second, put yourself in the car. You know, he could have earned an okay living just staying there and waiting it out. Mm -hmm. In three years of just being in New York, eventually he would have right. gotten, the, that's the way wrestling works, right? Yep. And it kind of becomes undeniable but this anyway. this guy had his, his will. Yeah. And, and more than that, his deep sense of personal knowledge of who he was, of his own value, told him like, no, no, no. I'm going to force this fucking guy yeah. to make me champion. And on some level, it's like, I don't want to wrestle on the show that that guy is holding me back. Yeah. I know what's going I'm on not gonna, here. Yeah, I'm not doing it. Right. And so to me, it's there's very little difference. Right. There's no doubt, by the way, that Bruno could have kicked the shit out of Buddy Rogers <laughs> nine times his size. Right. Buddy Rogers is a big guy, but like, and Bruno also, was 20 years younger than him and outweighed him by... And the fact that the match was under a minute long kind of leads to the shoot theory I do believe you know if, if we go if we go by buddy rogers being a guy that was so prideful he didn't want bruno going on before him what's changed that buddy is willing to do a job in under a minute right yeah no i can't understand it so i believe that it was uh i believe that buddy rogers in the ring like whether bruno really hurt the guy i do believe that when they were there buddy rogers knew yeah, yeah. He buddy, wasn't walking out of the ring as the champ. And Buddy could have been like, "Well, screw this. Yeah. I'll just take the dive right yeah, now. If you're gonna do, beat me, just beat but, me. I'll but, go home." But it doesn't matter because it was a shoot because Bruno demanded it. I mean, you never hear that story. So the where, story is a shoot in the yes. sense that like Buddy didn't want to give him the didn't want to give him the title. He didn't. And Vince Senior really didn't want to give right. him the title. He forced it. Yes. So to yes. me, the so story that's itself the shoot. is a shoot. The guy was like. I'm gonna because like if, you know you read Foley's book is one of my Mick Foley's first book is like one it's of incredible. the great memoirs of like our time yeah and maybe the best book about wrestling ever because it's the book I give to or I I, I would give it to girlfriends I gave it to my wife uh, people who don't understand did that make it that much longer before they would like hook up with you <laughs> <laughs> you give them a wrestling book is that you just added two weeks on the whole thing yeah. basically <laughs> but, but that's <laughs> that's yeah. the like I need you to understand this world. Yes. And this is the book. Because so, what is amazing to me about that book yeah. is it 
it it is the one document that shows you like exactly what it costs these guys emotionally exactly how much it means to them to know that the business has recognized and rewarded them mm -hmm. as the champion because every guy in wrestling and that's why the whole thing you can say it, there it is a shoot because it's really hard to become Tom Cruise in the world. Right. It's really hard to become George Clooney. It's right. really hard to become Julia Roberts. Like, if you can find a way... And those people, by the way, all really did it, regardless of if their movies are scripted. Like, they, they all it. really they did it. They had to, like, leave their house right. in Oklahoma. Yeah. And, you know, or Tom Cruise in Jersey or George, where, you know, and you, they had to leave their home, Indiana, I guess, with George. They had to, like, leave their home mm -hmm. and... Like get in a car and go to Hollywood and be like, well, I think I'm special. Prove to these casting directors, then prove to the writers, yeah, and prove and to the, the directors, directors and the producers and, and the money guys. The audience and, had to come. Yep. And then someone had to say, all right, I'm gonna give this guy a shot. Right. At at being Ethan Hunt in Mission Impossible. Like, right. You know, this whole thing has to happen. So, Foley's book when when Foley got to be champ, and to me that's the other great, the closest to Bruno to me is Foley, Foley. because. He wasn't supposed to be a champion. Right. He was barely supposed right. to be in the WWE. We'll put a mask on him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, none of this was supposed to happen for him. Vince doesn't put the guy with the sock. No. In, the, you know, as a, as the headliner right. in the WWE. Right. But also by the force of this guy just being like, I'm not going to stop. Right. It's for me one of the most inspiring show business books mm, ever. That's great. Yeah. If you think about what that book is. Yeah. Um, because Foley and I, I, I'm sure you know him well I know Mick a little bit and mm -hmm. I love him he's yeah. just like the guy in the book 100% 100% he's exactly who he presents himself yes. as yes yes absolutely what do you think it was about Bruno that made it so you didn't have that kind of typical I'm a kid rebellion like Bruno was a good guy and he made it so everybody was cheering for him and even even in the 70s and 80s I mean I know Hulk Hogan had that thing but Hulk Hogan was loved by small children Bruno was loved by small children, but also men, men. No, like, men. you know, teenagers like you, but also full adults like your dad would have loved him. What was it about Bruno that made it so that you actually well, liked I this think you gotta look squeaky at the, clean at the, guy? You got to look at the era. That wasn't really an era where wrestling had figured out that the anti-hero would be cheered for also. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, when the first time I saw that, so that... The bad guys were super important, but because of where the culture was, then like a genuinely good guy got, people did root for them more. There weren't a lot of people cheering when Stan Hansen, you know, broke Bruno's neck. Um, the, your question's really smart, but I, 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 I believe in the WWWF. So Terry Funk was cheered for and Ric Flair was cheered for. But somehow in the East Coast, right, the bad guys weren't really so. Those guys were in the middle of the country in the West, right? They, they were cheered for. But somehow in the WWWF, the way it was structured, the bad guys like um, the Executioners or like I said, you know, Ernie Ladd, there would be a small group of people cheering for them. Well, but also it was the coverage was dominated by magazines, right? Right. And the way the magazines would even talk about it. Um, you mostly rooted for the good guys. It changed when Backlund came. Two years, so when Backlund came in, in the beginning, young kids, 11, yeah. I rooted for Backlund. 14-year-olds mm -hmm. hated him. Right. And that's when it started to kind of switch. Uh -huh. So the difference between Bruno and Bob Backlund is Bob Backlund seemed like he never had to fight for anything. He was a squeaky clean college wrestler right. from Florida, mm -hmm. right? Uh, was that where he's from? Or he wrestled in Florida. Right. I think he, well, he came up from Florida. At the, that's what they sold him as at the time. Sure. He looked like... Uh, you know, he wrestled in high school. He was probably beat people up in high school. Mm -hmm. Then he kind of presented himself as this squeaky clean dude. He was a goody two shoes. Right. But you he know, was a jock. He was a jock. He Bruno, didn't... you felt like was a steel worker or something. Right. You felt like with Bruno, like he really came up from nothing. Like mm -hmm. he really uh, was trying to do it right. But, but then you also felt if he had to brawl, he would brawl. Right. And it's really interesting because like, you know, Backlund had similar pro in a sense that like Bruno would, would go like, well, I'm not the smartest guy, but I, I'm pretty tough and I think I'm going to go in there. And Backlund wasn't any more energetic. He would, well, Vince. No, he was just, aw, shucks though. Yeah, I, right. Bruno was a man of experience. Right. And, and, and Bob Backlund didn't seem like that. But I'll tell you something else. Mm -hmm. I can answer your question. I'm answering it wrong. Mm -hmm. what, what you have to really remember, Sam, is this is all before rock and wrestling. This right. is all before wrestling's mainstream. Right. 
Wrestling is still, when I'm into it in the 70s, subversive by its nature. Mm -hmm. Just being a wrestling fan was already rebellious. Just being a wrestling fan was part of the freak show. Of course. You were the So the I, fact that you're a guy who roots for the good guy wrestler, you're already, I'm already the rebel. A freak, dude. Yes. I'm already yes. a freak. My friends are only watching f- fucking football and right. hockey and tennis. Right. Like I liked all those things too, but what I loved, right. I mean I loved basketball. That was my first great love, but the other thing I loved was wrestling. And so I you would come into my room. And so okay, you have to understand I collected from the first time, so I was always a, re- a huge reader. Mm-hmm. That's why I became a writer. Right. So the the moment I saw the first wrestling thing at like eight, um, there was a magazine store in town, and I sort of remembered that I'd seen a magazine. I made my mom take me, and there were the three magazines: Pro Wrestling Illustrated, The Wrestler, and Wrestling. Right. Right. Uh, Inside Wrestling. Inside Wrestling. Yeah. Inside Wrestling, The Wrestler, and Pro Wrestling Illustrated. Yeah. Those three magazines, and I remember buying those three magazines. And then I started cutting out pictures of these people. Mm-hmm. And I just covered my whole room in <laughs> pictures of these wrestlers. And, you know, Abdul the Butcher with his face bleeding or um, Nick Bockwinkle with that hair. And so you, know, you would come into my room and, and I looked like um, a really strange kid who had this. And I had just stacks and stacks in the magazines. I subscribed to all of them. I'd go to anywhere I heard there was a new wrestling magazine. I mean, I still could tell you the names of the guys who wrote for those magazines. Of course. I was, I mean, you probably know Bill After, but like, I don't, uh-huh. I, um, I don't think I could really talk to him. <laughs> because those guys made up all the stories, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did they just totally make them up? Oh, oh, that I don't, oh, oh. Did they, they must have made up all this. They didn't really sit and have an interview with. Well, you know, it's interesting because a lot of those guys, like the, uh, George, uh, I always get Napoli, uh, yeah. Napolitano. Yeah. I was actually sure. just, I yeah. flew to WrestleMania with him. And so I was talking to him in the airport. It was the first time I'd actually had a conversation with him. But I mean, there were guys that would, that would travel place to place. And this idea, I think there were more kayfabe interviews well, happening right, than you think. That actual interviews as opposed to like... Right, right. Opposed, it always... But, it, I'm, but I'm sure a lot of it was also like, okay, I get on, when they were talking the about, you know, Dusty Rose wakes up and gets in his motorcycle. Well, and yeah, like, I mean, that's... I mean, the, all this stuff. Of the course. Dead, it's all just like them. Just, I mean, like they have to fill... Because picture being those, I always wanted to make a show about those guys. Dusty the report. Oh, the, just, 70s the 70s wrestling magazine wrestling writers. The 70s wrestling magazine writers. Like, so great. <laughs> picture like their day. Yeah. Like, what do you do? You get how many cigarettes they smoke. <laughs> I, just, I had to get out of bed and they're like, fuck, I gotta, I gotta feel like, and back then magazines were thick because like there were lots of ads. Yeah. There was no television really. Mm-mm. There were, you know, five, sta- three stations and no cable. But it was coverage of, I mean, I'm so glad that I grew up that there was still, like, I grew up in the 80s and 90s, so I feel like I was the last generation of magazines. You, you got a little of it, but, I got, was, yeah. but it was mostly, by then, it was all over television. But so yeah. you could only watch wrestling on midnight. Okay, we didn't have cable. So, like, and my dad was successful. It wasn't like, and I'm it not going to paint it. We just, there was no cable in And our, it was territories, right? So there was yeah. all this wrestling going on that you never... We would go to Florida to visit right. my grandparents. Right. And everyone would go out to go to a pool, and all I would do was turn the UHF channels... I would sit there in my grandparents' kitchen alone, just turning channels to try to find UHF wrestling. Yeah. And I, all I wanted to see was just a glimpse of Dusty Rhodes because he barely came right. to the East Coast. Right. You couldn't see these guys. So and it, by its nature, w- wrestling, and, and, and it was not a lot of my friends weren't into it. So all I had was this. There was no message board that I could write about. Of it. course. It didn't exist. No. So all I could do was like read the magazines, watch it closely and then find like try to turn like one or two of my friends onto this so, so they you could have someone to talk it. to about but it but also the storytelling clearly appealed to me in a different way so my friends would be like yeah that's cool but I the intricacies of the storytelling really started to matter to me and and the you know one of the most famous matches during the 70s in the East Coast was Chief J. Strongbow and Billy White Wolf against the Executioners for the title they'd really built this story up for a very long time mm-hmm. and no one knew who the executioners was. There was a rumor killer Kowalski was one of them. White Wolf and Strongbow. You know, in today's days, Strongbow would have been given the championship. But in those days, race, wrestling was so ra- racist, they would never give an Indian. Like, was Wahoo McDaniel the NWA champ ever? That I don't know. I don't think he... I know. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But they wouldn't give the belt to... No, right, right, right. ...an American Indian character. Because no, that though, was that's what he was doing. He wasn't the champion. He was the Native was, American character. And then and then he was the... But they would give the tag team. They would... Sure. They would give minorities the tag team belt. Sure. That And a lot of the time, minorities had the tag team belt. Right. But they were like my other... Chief J. Strongbow and, and Billy White Wolf. I loved them. They, they fought the executioners. And... Uh, 
they were winning. They won the match. And this is the first time this ever happened. A third executioner showed up. Mm -hmm. And then, do you know this thing? Uh -huh. Came from under the ring. Yeah. And it was Killer Kowalski. And then the ref didn't know and it was the third executioner. But I was so into the storytelling. I remember I thought about that match and how they, how they thought to do it uh -huh. for such a long time yeah. afterwards. Because I was like... Which is so funny because like when I'm a little kid... And I remember it blew my mind. And it made me think that WrestleMania 9 was one of the great WrestleManias of all time. Exact same thing. It was Doink versus Crush. And out of nowhere, you never would have thought another Doink comes out from under the ring. And it was just like, that was the, it was mind blowing storytelling to me. Did you later learn that that was the Executioner's first? <laughs> did you know that the executioners did that first? No, not until much later. Much, much later, later I realized that. That, that that had gone on, yeah. Yes. But at that moment, I was like, that's never, no, yeah. nothing like that has ever been done before. No, that's the thing. Yeah, it's yeah. a mind-blowing thing when you when they first yes. unspool that in yes. front of you. Uh, but yeah, at the top of it, and also because Bruno was the champ for so long, that's the other thing. He was the constant. And they were very good at making the bad guys part of the one thing about the kayfabe era that was clearly better that you cannot recapture is that the bad guys were really bad. I love that. So that is different. Right? Yes. The, because now we know, other than yes, Jericho might play it off, but honestly, it's too much information out there. We know Chris Jericho. We know that Chris Jericho does charity. Right. I mean, we know a whole bunch of stuff about Chris Jericho right. that you didn't know about Superstar Billy Graham. Right. You just, Superstar Billy Graham and the Grand Wizard, mm -hmm. these were just these assholes who were selfish and egomaniacal and hated you and hated them and thought they were super cool. So there was no way to pierce that. And so you thought, well, even if I know that um, something about they're not really, you know, I, I can see they're stomping when they hit. These guys yeah. are bad dudes. Yes. And so that also made it harder to be like, I'm rooting for them. Whereas now you're rooting for a character. Do you think, looking back on the legacy, do you think that it helped or hurt Bruno San Martino that he distanced himself so much and declared himself such an enemy to everything that came after him? You know, it wasn't until, and thank God Triple H was able to kind of make the thing happen where we could have yeah. that sort of bow on this thing. But the fact that the Hogan era, he was vehemently and vocally against. The Attitude Era, he was vehemently and vocally against. And on one level, you go, well, he's staying true to himself. But on another level, you go, is this a story of a guy who didn't evolve with the business and then got bitter? Well, he was old by then, too. I mean, he of was... Course. Yes, you can go along, but he was 60 years old. He wasn't wrestling anymore, for sure. But he was... There's still... There's always... If Bruno on some level can... Oh, sure. Listen, Go with he this. Cared there's a about, yeah. Well, as Shoemaker pointed out in the thing that he and I wrote for Which was great. It's on it's on the ringer. There's a it's uh, David Shoemaker who is a standout in that Andre documentary. I mean, he's so there's there's wrestling super fans like me and then there's wrestling historians. And Shoemaker is a, a historian. historian. Yeah. Um but yeah, you guys did. There's a great, and you go to the ringer and you can find it. There, it's the, your email correspondence about yeah. Bruno, and it's, we went back it's and terrific. Forth on yeah. Bruno and and um, so yeah, Shoe, Shoemaker points out that the to the Triple H brought them back together again, yes. which which he did. The legacy question. I think it depends on whether you think that exact. We mattered. I guess if if Vince would have put his arms around Bruno and Bruno would have allowed it, mm -hmm. and he was always talked about as the greatest champ, like as he was right before, which was as the greatest champion of all time. Mm -hmm. Sure, his he'd be more well known, mm -hmm. but I do think that his death was recognized. Absolutely. I mean, we're we're at a point now where it's certainly full circle. I mean, yeah, and you, we've seen it with the Ultimate Warrior. We've seen it with a lot. Of, we've seen it with Randy Savage. Like, you can go away for a long time and have bad blood, but as long as at the end you're accepted, that WWE part of your legacy is going to be uh, uh, put in the right perspective. Yeah, because even... I mean, I think, I think you could absolutely say it's a positive thing because this whole conversation has been about the fact that Bruno... Stay true to he himself. Did. He was who he was, and you know the, the the idea that he wouldn't like where wrestling was going. You know, I tried to make a documentary about Bruno, and um, I got I spoke to him on the phone once, and did you freak out a little bit? I kept it together, but he had Inside. yeah, he knew. Yeah, I he sent me. I I have on my wall at home a, a signed Bruno picture, and um, 
I put it in the background of a movie we made and then Dave and I named a character in Billions, Bruno, who's like the one kind of clearly noble character. He owns a pizzeria. And his name is Bruno. And he's for, named after... Of course he's named after Bruno Of course he is. That's him. Obviously. Yeah. Think about who he is in the show. That's Bruno San Martino. Yeah, yeah. And so... Um, yeah, and he gets to that... Mo- that's so I, great. So, that's I, so great. That character now like fully has, has come full circle for me. Yes. Yeah. Obviously, he's named after Bruno San Martino. <laughs> And in fact, we tried to get a picture of Bruno to put in there, but it was Bruno was sick in the hospital and we couldn't organize it. We were going to put his picture in the pizzeria. So, but um, I wanted to make this documentary, but I thought to do it, you would have to talk about kayfabe. Yeah. You would have to talk about his decision mm-hmm. not to break it. You would have to talk about the rift. And, and in the end, Bruno wouldn't do that documentary. Be, he made a different documentary by himself. There's, there, it's out there. It exists. Mm-hmm. But um, I think the legacy as he wanted it to be is intact and will only grow right. as this happens. Right. So the legacy we might have liked for mm-hmm. him, meaning where he was just more famous, basically, and where everyone acknowledged throughout. Like now he role, is, but throughout. Yeah. But he is exactly who... He wanted to be, I think, in a, in a way. He lived it and exactly you know, the way he wanted to live and it. And you know what? On some level, <laughs> because he decided to turn against what uh, Vince Jr. was doing, he was blackballed from the WWE, and they realized they couldn't have a Hall of Fame without him. So without without doing anything, without, uh, without, without compromising compromise. at all... He got through the black ball, got back to Stanford, and was on the stage at Madison Square Garden and we to accept both, an induction. We were, we were both there. We were both there. I went. I hadn't been to a wrestling show. So I, I took my son once to see Scott Steiner when my son was like six or five or something. It was incredible. Mm-hmm. But I, by that time, I would basically checked. That era of wrestling wasn't that interesting to me. I mean, it was fun to watch. The beginning, Brock and Big Show, that was fun to watch mm-hmm. when Brock was first wrestling. I liked that. Kurt Angle. The, right, in the early 2000s. For me, yeah, yeah. in the early, my son was born in 90, the end of 95, mm-hmm. so like he was five, so yeah, like 2000, whatever yeah. that was. That's when like, yeah, every talent in the world was, it was like the right, that, that yeah, attitude so there was era a moment hangover. There at when the it, end yeah. of the, atti- sort of right after the yes. attitude era, I guess. Yes. So we went once, but I hadn't been in over a decade, mm-hmm. and I went, I had to go to Bruno's Hall of Fame in, in, induction, and like I say in that Shoemaker piece, um, I didn't want to go as a filmmaker, a screen like I, I don't want any special treatment. Like mm-hmm. I know people, I really love the people at WWE. They're amazing, but I didn't call anybody. Right. I bought tickets in the rafters. Mm-hmm. I just put on Bruno Sermatino shirt and went with my son. And I just wanted to be there in the building when he was inducted into the Hall of Fame. And I'm so fucking glad that I got to see him standing up on that stage in the garden that he got to be in the garden one more time Mm -hmm. the garden got to shake and cheer for him Mm -hmm. and even though some of the young people didn't really know who he was but you could see the wrestlers knew oh my god yeah and you could see that sort of like the people I was sitting around were mostly my age and they were freaking out yeah you know I think there's nobody other than Flair who for a certain group of people means that much well I mean he and Flair mean maybe Dusty maybe he Flair and Dusty sure and that's sort of the... When did Dusty really start wrestling here, though? But yeah, on the East Coast, nobody... nobody. I don't even think Flair... Did Flair put in the time here, finally? In the in like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he did, but still, like, I, I still... Yes, he's not Bruno. Bruno, Bruno yes. was the guy on the East Coast. Yes. And, and he was such the guy that he did what Flair and Dusty did, which is take those local reputations and become a national star and international he's in Canada too you know what I mean like oh, like, yeah, like Japan those and, and all yeah, that yeah, yeah. stuff so yeah I mean I, I think that especially the fact that they were at Madison Square Garden and that may be the only time in the Hall of Fame because Wrestlemania is coming back to New York or to you know New Jersey next year but they're doing Hall of Fame at the Barclays so the fact that the one Hall of Fame ceremony that was at Madison Square Garden was Bruno's headlining year yeah you know it doesn't get much better than that. No, it really doesn't. Well, uh, Brian Koppelman, uh, your podcast is called The Moment. It's not a wrestling podcast, but uh, it's really... No, a... it's great. You can listen. I talk to everyone from like Seth Meyers to Baron Davis. Right. And it's a genius. It's just it's, it's a genius idea. And who knows? At some point, I could see a wrestler coming on that show and talking about I would love, a moment. I would love to do it. Foley and I have almost 
put it together at yeah. various times. Um, yes, that's a great. I, there are people I would love to talk to for sure. Cool, and man. Dusty, and, but the fact that Dusty and Bruno are gone, I know. It's really strange. Yeah. It's um. Yeah. Go go watch uh go watch some promos that Bruno did and go watch some promos. And I mean, it's great Dusty timing. Did. All the uh, all the WWF All Star stuff just showed up on the network. So you can see all that. You stuff can watch. Now. I think there's like two years of it or something. But th that was finally added to the like territory section of the WWE Network. So uh, yeah, I mean, check all that out. And on my action figure shelf over there, thanks to that Hall of Fame deal, they did put out a Bruno. I, I have figure. it. You I do. Was, it was bought for me as a gift. It's in my office. Good, good, excellent, excellent. Well, Brian Kaufman, and of course, thanks, uh, Sam. Billions is on Showtime, but uh, I would hope by now everybody knows that. I appreciate you being here, and we will see you again next time here on Sam Roberts Wrestling Podcast.